can I just check in on the room as a whole? We've kind of been through a lot, yeah, the last few years. We've been through some political eruptions here in the UK. We've been through um, COVID, and we kind of put the lid on that. We've got energy crisis. We've just about worked our way through the geopolitics. Are people generally feeling the next 10 years? Are the kind of waves ahead? Is it pretty smooth, smooth waters? Are, or are people feeling it could be choppy? 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 OK, seriously choppy, yeah? yeah? And so what do we do about that? How do we engage? How do we interact with that world? That's what I kind of want to talk about. And I want to start with a, um, a really unimpressive story, which is one of the least dramatic stories you're ever going to hear, which is, I got an email. <laughs> OK? And I knew immediately the name from this email, because it was a student from this master's I'd been lecturing on a year ago. And he was a brilliant student. But I remember also this thing we did as a class, where we'd done this exercise where if you don't just want to survive financially, but you kind of want to address some of these challenges on gender, on climate, on inclusion, on any, whatever it is. If you wanted to do that as well, you kind of gravitated towards the front of the room as a group. And then if you thought your theory of change in the back of your head was, you're going to need to know how to dance with power. You're going to need to work with the big institutions if you really want to drive system change. Then you kind of moved over there to the right side as well. And this student, who I'm going to call Rudy, so he doesn't get sacked, um, he was right there, kind of nose to the wall, front right corner. He really wanted to work with the system and drive change. Can I just check with you? Are there people here who also, kind of, in addition to you know, surviving financially, would like to have some impact? Yeah. yeah? And then what about the whole power dynamic? Are you going to be out there on your own, doing your thing, living the good life, or do you actually want to try to create some, some system change? Or think you, it may be valuable to try to do that? Some people on the right here? OK, so what did the email say? And I kind of knew where it was going just from the title. Because the title, which I read walking down the street, was, and he'd, by the way, gone and done that. He'd pursued his plan, and he got this job in this completely blue-chip management consultancy, like a seriously influential. And he'd been in there for just about 10 months. Um, I'd been waiting to hear what he was going to say. And the title was, How to Not Become a Corporate Robot. And we then met up the next day and talked. And he, um, he said, basically, what am I doing? I am optimizing cash flows. I don't know what that is either. But I'm optimizing cash flows. And he said, I feel like my dreams are getting hijacked. And the thing I'd like to talk with you today is those kind of early dreams you've got or those instincts that you want dreams that will really materialize, how do they not get hijacked? But even more ambitiously than that, I want to explore the possibility that you could actually flip it and not just avoid having the corporate robot hijack you, but actually gently, lovingly, consensually, in a way that's kind of win-win for everybody. <laughs> Can you hijack the corporate robot? Okay, is that a plan to try to talk about that? Okay, so there is um, a big question, which is, why bother? Why not just get out, live an ordinary life, be lucky, you know, feel grateful you've got a job? And I want to throw out one just angle on that. For a long time, I was, I was doing this Radio 4 program called Future Proofing. Um, and I don't want to overstate its impact on British society, because it was on exactly the same time as Bake Off, OK? So <laughs> even I would like tune in to Bake Off instead of the show. But it gave this sort of glimpses into the future. And I got into the habit of looking at these weak signals of the future. And I just want to throw out one and see what you want, you want to deal with this with. Um, the price of woolly mammoth tusks. Is it going up or down? It's good to see there's real consensus in the room on this, OK? It's plummeting. It's gone down from about $2,000 a kilo to, to, about, to about 300. Why? Because the ice is melting, the Arctic tundra. And this isn't a story about Willie Mount. This is about methane, OK? Just under Baikal alone, Lake Baikal, there's an estimated 424 gigatons. Ambient um, concentrations where, the, where it's melting around the edge of methane six or seven times the surrounding atmosphere. We're essentially shafted if that continues to melt. Um, are we doing anything, even though there's a technical fix? Because AI can detect the glimmer of methane, put in low-Earth observation satellites, then ground source heat pumps to stabilize it. We're not doing that, because there's no market incentives for anyone to do it. But bigger picture, 
we got this pattern of climate inaction. So those carbon disclosure project has got 23,000 signatories, all of them committing to disclosing what their emissions are on the assumption they will then decarbonize. When they reviewed the credible plans, what percent had credible plans? 0.4%. There was another management consultancy that studied net zero implementation strategies by corporates. What percent actually achieved their results? 2%, 2%. We've got a problem. And if I'm going to try to use like a really clunky metaphor with you, if you imagine a big old bus, okay, with all of us on it, that's headed towards a cliff, which is the type of driver you really don't want, okay? I'm going to offer you three drivers. One driver is, call it like the transformative leader driver. What do they do? They get behind the rear wheel, they change the direction of travel, steer left, and get us out of trouble. You've got another, which takes an unusual strategy says to the passengers, people, you see that cliff? Guess what? We're going to drive right over it. I'm not going to make any reference to political events recently. Um, then you've got a third strategy, which is the leader that gets behind the wheel and says, you know what? We've got a plan, everybody. We're going to transition left by 2050. <laughs> and then they set the signal left indication going and make some occasional announcements on the tannoy about how there's a real plan, and they're going to invest in the plan. But they keep on going straight over the down cliff. Which truck are we in right now? Which bus are we on right now? We're on the third bus. We're on the third bus. So why does it matter? This business of your dreams getting hijacked, because if they are, we're going to continue on that same trajectory. So the question I want to explore is, what are the mechanisms by which we can collectively start to pry the fingers of the invisible hand, the invisible hand of the robot programmed for short-term shareholder value maximization off that steering wheel and get it actually to do something that frankly is better for the bus. And for the last um, 18 months, because I got really bored with this, I'm like 25 years of failing to drive any meaningful uh, behavior change in corporations. I began a research project um, at the Smith School of Oxford where I've been doing the lecturing into like, what are the barriers? What is it that makes people fail? What causes the failure? And also, what are the success factors? Um, and I just want to throw out a few of the early findings that are coming out and a model of possible change, which is the pathway where the people who've really made it happen, they seem to be following some of these kind of moves in a playbook. And I got some sort of pictures to try to illustrate some of this. And I'm going to start um, in this process by pulling out one of these characters um, and taking them through a journey. But the end point, which I want to put out for you, is actually something close to this, something close to not burnout, not the frustration of feeling you're not driving change, but actually close to bliss, that you've really done something, that you've pulled something off. And probably everyone in the room, we've all felt that at some moment in our lives, yes? That you've done it done it. You've, you know, you've finished the race. You've climbed the mountain, real or metaphorical. You've done it. The warm wind through your hair, because that job has been done and done well. So that's where we're going to end. But I'm going to take you into some darker territory, if that's okay, before. And I'm going to take you into like a mix of emotions that contains in it not just those moments where it's really joyful and it feels like it's no effort, even when you're working, but actual pain and actual effort. And I want to start in a space where there's a dance you've got to do and a battle you've got to win between attention and distraction. So why do I say that? What are we asked to be? Are we asked and conditioned to be these Zenmeister, still indistractable orbs of attention? Or are we actually right now conditioned to be these inbox trolling, tick-tocking, clickbait, hungry, just distracted beings with no time at all. On those two extremes, is it attention or distraction that the economic model pushes us towards? It's distraction. It's distraction. The other day I was with my friend, um, this wonderful cr friend Chris, who works with the Archbishop of Canterbury, and my Youngest daughter played the great, had with great pleasure started winding him up by showing him the um, Instagram account of not the Archbishop of Canterbury, but the Archbishop of Banterbury. Um, 
with 4.6 million followers. I then spent the much of the night looking at the Instagram feed of the Archbishop of Scranterbury. I spent the night looking at plates of chips, basically. We know that to call it an attention economy is a big fat lie. We are in the distraction economy with Facebook getting $1.72 for every link we click on. But I want to suggest, if you want to win this battle of really trying to make some change, it's not just those surface distractions. There's deeper distractions of the people whose ideologies you are following. Jacques Lacan, the impossibly in in hard to understand French philosopher, talks about big other, that we're ticking big other's boxes as a lifetime journey. And there's also these seductive distractions of these things that are disguised as the real thing. I used to work at the World Bank, and there was this development project that was celebrated. They got 60 million of funding, which was for play pumps in Africa. And the idea was really sweet. The kids would play on the play pumps, which would be connected to a well, which would automatically pump up the water, and it would save the women from pumping the water, and there would be health ads on the carousels, and everyone would be a winner. The only problem was the kids knew they were getting played. They didn't want to get pimped. They refused to play. The women had to pump. It hurt their backs. It took a lot more time. The things cost $14,000, and they bust. And what was this? It was just a drop-down menu of shiny objects which actually are more problematic than doing nothing. Because you get bored of them. They don't work. They chew up your energy. They chew up budget. They stop you from doing the real thing. If you look at the people who've done the real thing, what have they all got in common? Take Christina Adani, Christina Adani, the food justice activist here in the UK, who, age 16, led the campaign for free school meals. It was her experience of kids who couldn't afford food. If you take Dolores Huerta, who led the Cisapuera campaign that got the great workers a union and inspired the Obama campaign, it was her experience with the communities of great works on zero-hour contracts, one dollar an hour. If you take even Fleming inventing penicillin, if you take Reese Hutchison inventing the hearing aid because his friend had gone deaf from scarlet fever, he couldn't bear looking at his mute, non-comprehending face anymore. Each of them what they all got in common? Yeah, they're not on Instagram, is one thing. <laughs> but they're all actually being there. They're all actually present. So if you want to slay that demon, I think there's a shift in mindset that's kind of crucial. And the first thing is just go slow. Go slow enough. This great philosopher, Martin Buber, talks about I and thou, these two ways of looking at the world. You're either in this I and it mode, where there's you and there's people who may be useful for you, or you're in I and thou where you see the wonder in them, and you kind of fall back in love with them, and you develop this intent towards them. Go slow enough for the entanglement with the other people or place to reach you. But also, allow yourself not to know, because you're going off piste. If you're going to do something new that is making change, it's change. There's no metrics. So trust yourself. Trust yourself, that negative capability. No one's going to be validating you. But last, know that what matters to you so there's this line from St. Augustine, which is something like, you can't bullshit the soul. It may not be exactly that, but it's basically that. The one thing that you can trust is that ache in your soul that tells you you're feeding it catnip. Your life is asking for more. And the one thing you can trust is when you're not feeling that, when you're feeling the power, that's because you're doing something. Where well, there's this alignment between what your soul's asking for, what the world is needing, and then it's not you that's having an idea anymore. It's kind of the idea will have you. Okay, so that's step one. The next thing that's going to happen to you, if you're lucky, is you're going to move into a phase of burnout. And here's the issue. I don't know if any of you have ever tried to drive a change, but you're going to run into two problems. The first, the organizations. When they really hate change is, of course, when they need it. And that's when the institutional threat rigidity kicks in. That's when the innovation budget goes. That's when the psychological safety shrinks. That's when the elbows become really sharp. That's when the shoot the messenger effect comes in. The ostrich effect, when no one wants to hear the plan you've got for change comes on. That's one problem. And then the other, of course, is the individuals. Because when you've got an organization that's in a state of stress, and there you're coming in, they're all like, they're in this lifeboat, clinging there for safety. You come in with your great new idea that's going to shake things up. What are they going to want to do with you? Push you right out of that lifeboat. So you've got three immediate graveyards you can fall into as a change maker. You can become the silent rebel, where you just abandon your dream. You can become the workhorse, where you just say, forget it, I don't even register it and resent it anymore. Or you can become the sustaining innovator, 
where you tweak it, but you're essentially back then to the bus driver that's signaling left, but not really doing the hard yards of changing the direction of travel. What's the mindset shift that the really successful change makers make? I want to throw out a few things here. The first of them is actually just to let go of the dogma and to start to listen. Could be that you're right, but it could be that this idea you've got, you're filled with bias because all your hopes and dreams are pinning on it. And maybe it kind of sucks. Maybe it kind of sucks. Maybe you've got to listen. Maybe you've got to acknowledge that their view actually is valid. So there's this principle of dialogue, which is called Bohmian dialogue, where you recognize and acknowledge to the other person that something they are saying is right. And in conflict resolution, until you can do that, you get nowhere. You're going to be lost in polarization. And then the last point is to realize that it's not just neutralizing their opposition. They are the obstacle because they've got power. If you can figure out what makes them tick, what they're after, then suddenly you can harness them as a platform. And that's what Christina Adane did. So there she is trying to get free school meals as the policy for British kids. She goes to the uh, Tory party conference and she understands that what they need to show is that they're in favor of family values, that what they need to show is that they're in favor of economic growth. And she positions it as a family value story. She gets the numbers commissioned on what the benefit to economic growth is of getting the free school meals done. And she gets a policy shifted that got free school meals uh, for 800,000 people. So work with the obstacle. And then, if you're lucky, you're going to move into build out. And what's the point here? To let go of the fantasy that you are numero uno to let go of the boss mindset, to realize there is no transformative leader. There is only a transformative team. And what you've got to do is harness that diversity, build in all the diverse skill sets you've got, and ultimately start to build out your obsolescence. And if you're really lucky, you may then get to this final stage of bliss. And here, I'm not saying celebrate wildly, but don't deny it. Don't deny it. Don't necessarily have like a three-week rampage of medieval wassail, but allow yourself to have some joy. And there's a great study by Desi and Ryan that shows what is the real secret of proper, deep contentment, close to bliss. And they say three things. They say agency, they say connectedness, they say, uh, and, and autonomy. And with this process, what you've done is you've turned up the dial on each of them. Agency, you did it. Autonomy, it was your thing. And connectedness, it was that that gave you both the collective efficacy to do it, but also for that brief moment, freedom from the prison of yourself, your own ego, your own daily BS. So what have you done with this? You've changed a part of the world. You have changed a part of the corporation, a tiny bit, but you've planted a seed for real difference. But you've also, I think, done something really important to yourself, which is you've done something with the wiring of the robot that could be you and that you could become. Because you've given that robot, which is used to the thin gruel of the bonus and the corporate hamster wheel and its payoffs, you've given it a taste of something different. You've given it a taste of something different that feels much deeper. And on top of that, you've given yourself and those who've worked with you the understanding that we are not helpless, that we do collectively have efficacy and the possibility to expand your radius of intent and to move on to doing it again. I've talked a lot about bliss. The bliss I now really offer you is that that was my big finish. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs>